Next up is uh, Patrick Olsson from Arista. Thank you. Okay, we're doing great. Awesome. Um, it's been a few years since I've been here. I don't know if everyone recognizes me. It's Captain Automation from Arista. For the past couple of years, I've been using my boss and colleagues to try to pass on the automation. Um, Evangelium in English didn't quite work. Uh, <laughs> And we're sort of reaching the last destination. Today we are going to talk about what happens after we have automated the provisioning of the network. What happens then? And if you haven't automated your network, you're also going to need this. Because if you're still doing CLI, guys, pick up the pace. Uh, that's going to figure out how it works. I'm just an engineer, right? Uh, woo! <laughs> So we're going to try to clear out what the meaning of automatic network validation means. We also need to try to figure out why we need it, uh, how, maybe understand a little bit where it can be usable. And also, I'm going to show you a few boring demo, scren demo uh, screenshots. Now, first of all, uh, when I was talking to Siri at NetNode, it was very important that the pictures were not infringing any copyrights. So I took a few pictures on my own. Please bear with me, and it was a bad hair day, okay? If you have any question afterwards or want to email me, I have the best email <laughs> address in the world. PO at arista.com. Purchase order. At, yeah, okay, yeah, you get it. <laughs> Very good. So what do we actually mean? Uh, when we have connected a network, and believe me, I, I, I do trust the guys out there doing the most of the stuff or not. Uh, but we want to figure out how is the network connected. Is it actually as we intended? Are we actually delivering the packets as we intended them to? Also, there are 1,001 ways to design a network, whether it's MPLS or VXLAN or, I don't know, segment routing. Am I hitting anyone's buttons here? No? Okay, great. Uh, also, you need to deploy services in this. It's awesome in the network. Actually, the best network is the one without customers on it because it behaves perfectly. But you want to do services on the network, and you want to make sure that your service design have come up right, and the packets or whatever are uh, ending up where they intended to. And also, every now and then, people actually want to know that the service they bought is actually being delivered. So you want some kind of SLA reporting. Sounds like the perfect storm, right? And you have a network that has at least three vendors in it. You want to do this. All the vendors have their own tools and tool sets. And there you are, and you're stuck. So we're going to also discuss a little bit on how we can attack this and don't care about the vendor. Believe me, I work at Arista, but I'm not here to sell Arista devices today. I'm not even here to sell you a framework for uh, automated network validation. I'm just going to discuss open source. So great. So why? Well, if you automate the provisioning, as my colleagues previous years have been discussing, and doing telemetry, as I discussed the first time I was on stage, what could go possibly go wrong with your automation, right? Um, well, there are a few things that we need to consider, uh, which are quality automation and bad input, workflows, and also the unpredictable uh, local loop. So the quality, would you trust that DevOps engineer, by the way? Uh, it looks like he knows what he's doing, and he's sitting at a window at Thailand or something. Um, it depends on what frame your framework you're using. You could be using you know, Ansible or Chef or Puppet or, or, or whatever tool. But it comes down to uh, the actual uh, maturity level of your DevOps staff, how secure this is. We can have the best framework in the world, but if the guys can't use it, it's going to suck anyways. And also, maybe you're not automating all the, the, all the parts of your workflow. You still might have a step in the middle where something has to happen manually. Let's say the local loop. So when it comes down to automation, we very soon we have been discussing this in previous years, but the, the source of truth is extremely important. What you input to the automation is what goes out to your network. So it's very good that, that, that you know, this needs to be, uh, um, it can't become better. It's like the, the chain, right? No chain is stronger than the weakest link. Same here. No automation is better than the source of truth. Even worse is if you have a source of truth and you manually transfer that source of truth from your source of truth into your automation. Uh, I got fat fingers. I guess more people have that. Uh, also, uh, <laughs> if you actually have some kind of API or anything, inputting your data 
into your automation, you, you still have, could have manually added data to your source of truth in the first place, which, which will you know, be a problem. Um, workflow can be, as I discussed, could be parts where you have uh, parts of them are manual, but also some parts are uh, maybe have dependency on each other. And if one of these steps fail, we're back to the chain where one link could be weaker than the other. And if we don't make sure that this is working and having some kind of way to make sure we have a state that is consistent so we can check this, we're also going to end up with a nice explosion. Now, the unpredictable local loop. Show by hands, how many people have connected a customer and the cable was wrong the last mile? OK, we have a few people who are honest in this room, and some of them are just lying through their teeth. Very good. So <laughs> local loop, messy cable arrangement, bad patching, uh, bad documentation. You know, I'm not going to blame any companies, but you stand there in the, uh, in the central office. You're standing there with your perfect N uh, the Chrome, work uh, Chrome tool, and you're standing there, and you're putting the wrong cable to the wrong bridge. Uh, not so good. You might even hire third party to do this for you, so you don't even have control of that process. And there are misunderstandings, especially when you're working across the world. Maybe talking to a data center in another part of the world where they speak another language. Uh, we can have huge misunderstandings on where the cables are going. So the unpredictable local loop is definitely something we want to have control over, or at least be able. How would we do this then? Doesn't this fantastic provisioning tool have any ways of, of actually checking this themselves? Like, people tend to write validation modules for Ansible. Why is Ansible not enough? Well, for first of all, I love Ansible. Don't get me wrong. I use that a lot. But there is a problem of keeping state between different playbook runs, which means you can't create dependence in between runs. Even inside your own Ansible playbook, where you have executed something for one device, you might want to have an if and then else for the next device. It's not possible. Um, so you get no reactions on event or also events on a device. If you get something that happens when you're doing something, Ansible may or may not have a good way to, to react to that. Also, Ansible loves structured data. Looks like I'm hating Ansible. I told you I love Ansible, but not for validation. Ansible is not written to parse unstructured data. If you get output back when you do something, it needs to be structured, preferably YAML or, or JSON or something. That will work best. And as I also mentioned, you can't really correlate information between two devices in that sense. Now, the other end of the board, I have some Python guys at my office. Why can't they do it? So why is scripting not a good alternative? Well, actually, if you have a good stuff, already built your tools, been testing them for 10 years, it could be an alternative. But do remember, anyone can you know, fall in front of a bus. <laughs> uh, they might even get an offer from your, from your uh, competition. Uh, or they just might lose their mind, like this poor guy in this picture. So maintaining code comes down to an equation of amount of code and time, uh, time, and it will be also when you're trying, also maybe one important point here, yokes aside, when you're doing scripting, if you want to do a simple task, it takes a lot of work. Uh, when you want to do a complex task, maybe you can actually uh, think that, that, that it, it, it makes sure that scripting is, is good enough uh, because you can take that time. Well, so we rule out scripting. So what, what should I do? Uh, why invent when you can steal and reuse? There are several frameworks that only exist to make different kinds of network validation. I'm going to talk about robot framework here. Uh, I'm not selling robot framework. There's no license agreements. It's open source. So why would I, well, first of all, <laughs> I'll go directly to the why, but open robot is open source. It's maintained as such. You can contribute yourself. Uh, it's written in Python, which is not maybe that important, but you know, just for you the background. Uh, 
you can access different devices using different protocols. They have several modules and different ways to log into an actual device and do something. Uh, they can interact with the device. You, you actually have something interacting with the device, being able to send commands, parse commands, and, and react up on that. Uh, and when I'm talking about devices here, I'm not just talking switches and routers. Uh, it could be servers, could be anything. And then we can parse the unstructured data and pass on information in that stream of unstructured data back to whatever report or file or even react on another robot framework action to use that data. Which means I can correlate data for several actions and devices, which makes this a little bit stronger than Ansible uh, when it comes to automation. So pip install robot framework, guys. It will be awesome. So few few use cases here. The one and only slide I will say, Arista. Um, this is a network. Looks like a data center network, but it could also you can also interpret the top routers there as a, a uh, core network. And you have PEs in the middle layer, and in the bottom layer you have CEs. Now, if I want to make sure I have connected everything, wouldn't it be awesome if I could ping or use whatever protocol to make sure that every device is connected where it should be? And how much time does that take when I have a network with 500 routers? Well, it can take some time. Um, also, if I want to be able to secure that a service has been deployed correctly, meaning maybe I want to do some kind of protocol check between all VRFs and all devices, which is an n, time, uh, n times n problem, well, it becomes a problem <laughs> that will make your, your execution manually take a lot of time. Uh, Maybe you want to be able to go all the way down to the CE, or in the data center case, go to a server and make sure you can ping all other resources inside that tenant in your network. How would I do that? Well, I can deploy robot, uh, robot framework to do that work for me. So here's a screenshot. In this particular case, is it SSH that is used to connect to the device? Uh, unfortunately, you can do better than have clear text password and usernames in your, uh, in your uh, robot framework file. I'm just lazy, okay? That's fine. Um, and then you also know the password for my lab now, Rista1234, so that's going to be awesome. Um, I can also, as you see, since it's actually logging into the device, I can use any uh, command. In this case, it's sending a ping inside the particular VRF for a certain destination. Now, if you would be an intelligent, or actually I would say this, if you thought about it and bought a device that actually allows you to access, bash, or install whatever module you have, and the TAC will still take your call, you can install iperf or any other cool tool on your device that you want to send as a command instead, and then parse that data when it comes back. And the last way, the last thing there is that you have, um, it's basically screen scraping. And everyone like me, including me, says, ah, screen scraping. But in this case, it's cool, because we can do that on unstructured data. And we can pick out the data that we need and decide what is a good result on this particular test. This is a very simple file. I'm not catching data, throwing it to other, wor you know, other works or, or, or tests and stuff like that. I made it simple in this example. But I actually then I decide what is a good result in this case. Could have been, uh, could have been a wget or, or, or a curl and make sure I get the right HTML, or the first part of the HTML right, or whatever, not just a ping. And also, the input that is coming back is by Robot Framing automating a, a it automated does an HTML page to create test results, uh, which then in its turn will be clickable that you can you know, uh, publish on, on, on a web server to make sure you can see that data more properly. This is how a test run could look like when you're running that test. So you see that, that this is a ping full mesh between all VRFs on all PEs. And also you use the result fielder. You actually get the data from this test, just showing that the uh, actual test file, that data will be used in the output here. And it also tells you whether it's a pass or a fail, of course, because you set that uh, condition yourself, what was a success or not. This is the HTML version of the report. You will get uh, uh, clickable. You can go further down into this. You can ex you know, extract this as hard copies as PDF and give to your boss. And this is when we're coming back a little bit to SLA reporting as well. We can use this data or output as basis for, for SLA data. 
you can also do search into this test result. And there's another nice button there. It's, it's the log. You can click on the log, and you can see exactly what was going on. And it actually collapses all your tests, and you can expand the tests uh, to be able to click down and drill down what actually went wrong. Why did this uh, test fail? Or if you, you know, for that matter, why did it pass? But you can dig down here and make sure you can see uh, what was actually going wrong. Very good. That was uh, slightly quick. Any questions? Oh, one question. Awesome. I was thought I was getting offline and get off stage, but. Um, so my question is, um, this uh, robot framework seems to mostly be for initial setup or test cases. It doesn't seem to be like the kind of thing that's meant for interacting with OR and API. Sorry, a test for API? No, no, true, true that. It's, it's mostly for, uh, I would not say only day one operations, but also for day two operations when you deploy the service. But you're right, it, it does not really, well, you can write a module that can interact with APIs, but then you need to contribute to the project. Yeah, um, I just know that I have in the past, for previous employers, written uh, software that um, it's also meant for interacting with various kinds of vendors, uh, precisely because we want to uh, we want to um, control things uh, all the time. Like let customers create new things in the customer portal that automatically gets pushed to the switches and stuff. But I assume robot and such is not for that. No, I, I don't. Oh, no, it will not fit that full use case. No, okay. I would say yeah. no. Thank you. Good. Great. Patrick.